Welcome, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce or welcome back today's speaker, Devin Desai. Uh, Devin is a law professor at Thomas Jefferson School of Law in San Diego. Uh, he was previously uh, academic research counsel at Google, and he also spent a year here as one of our visiting fellows. Many of you probably remember him. Uh, so today he's going to talk about <laughs> what happens when you take two uh, inc incredibly complicated cutting edge subjects and slam them together, 3D printing and patents. Let's hope. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I was part of the first crew ever uh, of fellows, I think, at CITP, and it really did change how I looked at things. And what I'm hoping for is this, to me, is a continuation of many, many, many afternoons of I would say, well, the law sort of does this when tech people would say, doesn't it do that? No, not really. Uh, and then the flip side is I would be the unfrozen caveman lawyer saying, but the technology does this. And the tech people say, yeah, you know, not really. Um, but in the long run, we seem to come to some better understandings. Um, and in that sense, this really is a continuation of the work from, from over the last few years. Um, but the slightly maybe different iteration is that I think what's really uh, happening in a bigger way to think about many, many things that we see in so many areas of technology, law, and policy is that Digitization and new information practices are really challenging the core industrial revolution premises and economies that underlie much of intellectual property law and policy that we're struggling with. So an assumption in intellectual property might actually be unspoken but powerful, and that is that maybe it always was designed for business-to-business -business interactions, that it doesn't really scale well at all. And that, in fact, cost to infringe, we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes in any area of intellectual property in terms of why it worked, uh, if ever. Of course, we, we're somewhat familiar, especially with this crowd, that digitization is going to change business and legal realities. Right? In every sector, this is a truism. But I think the real difference is you still will have early monetary and other cost issues that create barriers that get, make it not as obvious about where the technology will change core ways we approach the world. So when it starts to reach a wide range of businesses and individuals, and all of a sudden it scales to a more personal level, everything tips over. We saw that in copyright. And I, what I'm suggesting is we're going to see more and more of this because digitization is reaching actual tangible things. It's a key part of the way, then, um, that we will see in 3D printing some really interesting core assumptions get challenged, if not toppled. So 3D printing offers some specific opportunities for creation, and in that sense has many of the benefits of any general purpose technology. Rapid, unpredictable experimentation, faster learning, increased knowledge growth. But at the same time, these shifts are going to challenge the core assumptions in patent and copyright and trademark law. As an author has put it regarding a different technology, nanotechnology, radically new technology inspires lyrical utopianism and melancholy catastrophism. So I want to get into some basics of how 3D printing works and the, digital, uh, the idea of digital things as well as some legal implications. After I talk about the, the core issues of 3D printing, I'll look at different IP, and I want us to hopefully think about IP more as regulation, not as a given that it has to be protected or not. And I'll offer a couple futures. In one, current incumbents who are doing really well under the patent system are going to dig in their heels, and we shouldn't be surprised at that. And in another one, instead of fighting what might be the round two of what has been called the copyright wars, they embrace the change and actually exploit what they have as other assets. You might guess I lean towards the latter outcome. So I'll offer a couple legal ideas that might help get us to that future. So 3D printing. One of the promises, very law sort of standard analysis, I'll give you three possibilities, though there's probably more, um, is that it really is the ability to make almost anything at various moments. There's the home, there's definitely startups, as well as large firms. Home, and one of the areas that's uh, taking off like crazy are toys. People are making from scratch, but they're also taking uh, Mattel's stuff, Barbie. Mattel doesn't have a great history of being happy about people playing with their items. Um, but nonetheless, they're taking them and kids are redesigning them, coming up with putting out new heads, their versions of the dolls. In some ways, if you're familiar with fan fiction, they're actually taking action figures that they love and turning them into new iterations of themselves. Um, in the startup and small business world, you're seeing custom parts. You're seeing people who are doing some really interesting rapid prototyping. 
And at the large firm level, it turns out that uh, when Neil Gershenfeld at MIT, who's one of the real evangelists and, and pioneers in the space, wrote a book about the area not that long ago, about four years ago, he said, it's not as though we're printing jet engine parts with it. Well, GE, a year and a half ago, bought a company precisely because it is now, GE Aviation is making jet engine parts with 3D printers. So why is that possible? Well, at one level, we can think of 3D printing as a PC for things. But before we get to that, we have to remember, it actually comes out of a very common thing for everyone in this room, the actual laser printer. In fact, patents play a role here because a lot of this came about because of expired patents in this space. So we won't necessarily do the talk into this, but when there's a debate about, well, do patents create innovation and incentives, et cetera, et cetera, at one level of the story, absolutely, patents were behind a lot of interesting work on laser printers. Those things expired, and then there were a whole bunch of follow-ons, which is kind of what we hope for. And what folks did is they took this core technology and created these, or this. Pretty ugly, but by design. The hardware is, so far, most of it has been fairly open source in its approach, though there are some shifts now that there's more money in the space. But they are designed as, in some ways, you think about the almost romanticized, you know, Wozniak, Jobs, all the early hardware people, Silicon Valley in the, in the late 70s and early 80s. It's very similar. People can go in, they can plug things in, they can pull them out, they share the designs, they keep making them, they keep going forward and forward. The way it works is this platform, once it's fed its information, will rise slowly and basically most of the materials to, that m people are familiar with is plastic. So it then is additive manufacturing. Some people cringe when they say, it's not really a printer. Well, fine, it's not. But it's, it's based on that technology, and it's just easier and cooler, I guess, to say 3D printing. But what's actually happening is it is adding each layer, and the machine then, by, when it's done, as the platform goes up, you get a finished product. Another key point is the software to date has been essentially open source. Again, this is a key area for understanding some of the policy implications, because together, both the open hardware and the open source operating aspect have made this technology really move at the pace that starts to make people think about the tipping point for personal computers in the 70s and 80s, though that was not open. We still have this moment where you're getting rapid changes in the technology and improvements at astonishing speeds. The actual files that run it are CAD files. Now, CAD files tend to be old stuff. Many people in this room might be familiar with them. Um, but they do take some skill, right? You're talking about designers who are making cars or using them for blueprints, and that's great. And there are people who are sharing these in an open way, so that's not a big deal. But at the flip side, you also have some really cool technology that's allowing, again, someone like me who has no skills whatsoever in that space, right? I just play a technologist on TV, not really one, to be able to design almost anything. Um, Oh, sorry, I should have mentioned. So besides plastic, the material science has moved extraordinarily rapidly, too, um, just to back up a moment. Uh, during the writing of this, the, we went from basically plastics to uh, you have ceramic, you have different metals, you have, in fact, cake frosting, just because I assume people wanted to show off with it, um, living tissue cells. It is astonishing how quickly this happened, literally in the year of writing the paper. But this is the other part, the scanners. Again, this is probably already out of date because these prices were from a few months ago. But these are very simple ones where the people making the 3D printers realized if they want consumers to buy it, they, you can now take something. So getting us back to the patent moment, imagine you know, the better mousetrap or widget if you prefer. It used to be that it would take us time and skill to, to, to copy it, to make it, to possibly infringe it. Now someone like me can take, buy a scanner put the item in front of it, get the file, and then have the printer print it. Even simpler, I have seen fifth and sixth graders in a two-week period take a digital camera, take about 20 pictures of their heads, upload it to a free file that blended it into a design file that they then used in Blender, which is an open source um, file uh, editor, and then make their own toys of their heads. So again, as always, if the kids of that age are able to do it, and people think, oh, it's not really going to become common, it is, is at least, I think, where we're headed. Furthermore, the price is dropping like crazy. Um, 
again, during the writing of this, it went from being maybe $2,000 for a quality home one to $1,200 to last week, I think it dropped to a really nice one for about $900, sold at Staples. Plus, sort of like, again, early days of computing and printing, you have, um, instead of Kinko's, you now have UPS and Staples just got into the game, where if you don't want to use your home printer and you want to use a better quality one, they have nice ones that are still not super expensive. You can take your file in and they'll print what you want. So, a whole bunch of different things. Just, you know, this is not super complicated, but there's a lot of detail in here. And here, this is actually a fair, it's hard to see maybe, but this is a fairly good replica of that. This one is perhaps more interesting. According to the file, these articulate. And it was in one pass. In other words, it was not that you had to print each little delicate shoe for this necklace. It was, it printed and was all ready to go in one shot. It's really sophisticated in the precision of what it can make, right? So as opposed to the era of lathes and milling machines and all these things where we've had access to, we could have copied someone else's thing. It took a lot of time, a lot of skill. This is a one-off print can get you some very sophisticated things. So depending on who you are, this is exciting or scary. So quickly, right? You can imagine Lego may not be thrilled with that. But car companies are doing things with this. So when people talk about the overused and perhaps abused term innovation, here it is. There's this and this. So there's a whole excess capacity in some ways, some people have documented, of people who've been to design school. But it turns out not everyone gets to be a car designer. So they design other cool things, but that's not what they dreamed of. They're now crowdsourcing personally made kit cars where different groups are saying, we want to make the whole car for X dollars. And the group then talks about what fenders or you know, mirrors might go for. And they actually talk about, well, that's cool, but that's going to be $1,000. Someone redesigns it, brings it down to 200 And then, because of US law, they don't build the car. Uh, the company doesn't build the car because you have to then pass safety tests. So instead, you then go to Arizona, where the company is based. Though I don't think Irby is in Arizona. This is a different company. Uh, and you assemble it yourself because if you do it yourself, it's OK. Spoons play a weird role in trade dress, which is something we'll talk about briefly. This is probably, I don't know if I'd even be as good as this ugly thing, but this is, I think, someone's head on a spoon. But again, here's a slightly more uh, detailed one, and there's our Lego friend. To give you a little idea, the other way to think about this, it's computer numerical control, right? In other words, the, we use this already for lathes. This is not made from a 3D printer. But the technology is actually still something that many people use. You have a machine. You give it the, computer, the numerical information. It then cuts whatever you wish. Now, these are all designs that have a certain amount of protection from trade dress. What's interesting about them, I'll go quickly, is this. This, by saying parametric, what they're implying is with a decent sized or large enough printer, the file itself could make it from a tiny dollhouse to usable in your office or bedroom or whatever it may be. Here's one example. Living cells print tissue and organs. You're getting large scale. Uh, there's a couple groups, one at Stanford and one, I want to say, in Belgium that is actually using 3D printing technology to print full houses. Right. This is high fashion, bikini tops, and full dresses. And then the red herring, guns. Now, gun control is a separate debate. What I find most interesting about guns is this. It is legal under federal law for any of us to make a gun at home. Right? This is a heavily regulated piece of equipment, both from safety and other issues, as well as by intellectual property. Right? So if we have lathes and mills and all these great things, we could make these. But here's the difference. About a year and a half, maybe two years ago, some folks got together and made the AR-15, which is the civilian version of the M16. Again, very regulated. They fired, I believe it was between four to six rounds. And some people said, mocked them. Ah, you only fired four or six rounds. Many others said, they fired four or six rounds from a rifle that they made at home. You got to be kidding me. They waited. And about a year and a half later, they then were able to put up a video of them firing their latest version, which had 600 rounds fired during the demo. And they said, the only reason we stopped is we ran out of ammo. Now, 
to me, the most interesting piece of this is, again, this is a very sophisticated device that's protected by and regulated by a whole bunch of law, including patents. With 3D printing, these folks were able to very rapidly improve their material design and some of the science to, within a year, make a very functional, sophisticated weapon. And this takes us to IP. Because if we think of IP like other regulation, it turns out that expense and skill is probably doing a ton of work to make these regulations operate at all. So at a general level, when we start to think about 3D printing and intellectual property, what I'm suggesting is the Industrial Revolution and intellectual property laws supporting the economy are absolutely about a different economy based on large-scale cost. You needed a ton of capital to have your research, to have your production, have your distribution. And so infringement at any level that really started to matter needed a similar amount of investment. But copyright, as I said at the start, was really our canary in the coal mine, right? Once music, film, and books were no longer easily um, protected be, by cost barriers, we saw an explosion of what was already out there, latent creativity, right? Some of it was infringing, but a lot of it wasn't. That's the good and the bad of the shift. In some ways, I believe the copyright law, the sad part about the copyright wars is it was the tail wagging the overall debate. It is an important, but nowhere near as big a part of the economy as what's covered by patent law. So another way to think about this, if you think the copyright industry was upset, you ain't seen nothing yet. There's a chance that the patent and trademark industries are going to come after these sorts of technologies. Not necessarily, but they could. Because digitization is reaching the rest of the economy. To push this, if you're not convinced yet, there are some scientists in um, Scotland who have a 3D printer. Granted, this one is definitely in the prototyping stage in that you can use it in a university, nowhere else. Chemical compounding. Pharma alone will not be happy about that. Right? It is moving incredibly fast. Now, let's think about patents. The funny thing about patents is it's a fairly simplified version of it is that there is a core bargain. You disclose how to do your cool thing. In exchange, you get a type of exclusivity, right? There's always been infringement, but it was arguably not as rampant because, again, of the cost. Now, another interesting wrinkle in patent law is it is technically strict liability. There are some law
printing space, other IP, mainly in trade dress and design. Because what's interesting about trade dress and design is this has become a huge battleground of late. If, if you followed a little bit of the patent design issues, as well as some of the trade dress issues in Samsung and Apple, right? we can decry the idea that anyone should be fighting about a curve at the bottom of a phone or a little circle at the bottom, but these fights are going to persist. But with 3D printing, the whole thing might become sort of silly, right? Or at least we might ask, why are we really trying to pretend that this design should or can be protected anymore? Because at least as regarding trade dress, right? So trade dress here, simple shorthand. Think of a Coke bottle. Coke has a trademark, which is called trade dress, in that contour shape. That type of design has to get a certain protection. Now, the way that works is, in theory, if we all go make Coke bottles, there is one type of uh, violation there that people say is really bad, um, well, at least if you're a holder of that trade dress, which is called post-sale confusion. Now, in simplest terms, post-sale confusion is, it, the famous case on this actually had to do with a very cool clock. And the idea was, if I get a knockoff clock, and you all know it's super expensive, but I shouldn't be able to afford it, that somehow if you see it in my house, even though you know it may not be from the original person, the prestige of the clock is eroded, and the harm to the marketplace is actually about, well, it's no longer as rare as it used to be, right? We're creating an artificial scarcity there. Well, with 3D printing, if it becomes super common for all of us to just kind of hit print on things we like that are cool designs, whether or not anyone's going to think anything comes from a particular source seems like those assumptions are going to go out the window. We're not going to have to say, did they really buy it or did they get it at a knockoff? We might realize that many things are easily duplicated just like they are in non-tangible worlds. The other interesting thing about trade dress in terms of a weird moment for law is that to get the trade dress on something like a spray bottle or cellular phone, you actually have to do a little bit of work. It requires technically proof of substantially exclusive and continuous use thereof, meaning of the design, as a mark by the applicant in commerce for five years before the date on which the claim of distinctiveness is made. Well, this is really strange if you think about 3D printing. What in the world is exclusive use when everyone can do it? Right? Normally, you would police your competitors who might be doing it. That's sort of a no-brainer. So you could go after them. The odd part here is, if you imagine Monster the Drink Company makes its version of its cool bottle, and they want the kids to use it like crazy, but at the same time, they can't let them print it on their own, unless, as I said, they realize they should license it and control it. But if it's already out there being made, we get some new questions. Do we care about home use? Do we care about uses that aren't really commercial in the way that the law has gotten us to this day? So the irony, in some ways, in trademark law is that what you're really seeing is that we're regulating what Barton Beebe has called sumptuary interests. In other words, we're regulating how we consume things that are otherwise very low cost to rep reproduce. So with trade dress and trademark, it turns out that the law claims we don't care under this thing called anonymous source doctrine who's really behind the mark. We just know that someone is backing up the Coca-Cola. Doesn't matter if it's really in Atlanta or anywhere else. But the truth is, if you start to think about brands, even the Princeton logo, some people want it just because of the, the symbol itself. Right? That's the sumptuary nature. We may want designs and logos and certain items just because they're cool, not because of what's behind them. Nonetheless, as more and more places of manufacture arise, consumers might actually care who's behind the goods or the design. In fact, we might want to know, did that actually come from this specific file source or not? So if you're selling essentially the same thing or something easily duplicated, your brand as a sign of this is an authentic source um, and also high quality is going to mean much more. So producers are, might have to take a much stronger stand about whether their goods or plans or designs are any good at all, and in fact should rush into that market to plant that flag rather than try to stomp out everyone. Because a consumer, as we've seen at least with music and books, 
is probably happier knowing that the file is clean and getting it from an authorized source. So 3D printing might reduce a little piece of trademark law, the trade dress world, but it should enhance the, uh, any incumbent's ability to say, come to us for design and we'll let you print it at home if that's what you want to do. That said, there could easily be a world where the, all the patent industry say, Devin, you're nuts, we're going to attack. So what would that look like? Well, roughly, there's a whole bunch of places they might go. A classic would be to go after the manufacturers. And though, although it's been brief, I would say that if anything qualifies, uh, which under patent law is the, the core source for this concept, of a technology capable of substantial non-infringing use. Some of you might be familiar with that from the so-called Betamax case. That's actually a patent standard that was brought over into a copyright argument. And by the way, if a VCR, which can really not do that many creative things, is substantial non-infringing use, I got to think that a 3D printer, which is really quite an interesting machine, but it only does you know, printing as you direct it, is going to qualify. So going after this doesn't make much sense, unless someone somehow came with one that was specifically only to infringe one thing. But I don't see that happening. You could see someone trying to go after um, the materials. But again, a lot of this, these are commodities. So for the fringe issues like gunpowder or drugs, we already probably address that because we do monitor people who are buying large quantities of, let's say, for instance, I have allergies. So for me, I like Sudafed when the allergy season pops up. But of course, I have to give my driver's license in, in I think, almost every state. And you know, if I start walking off with crates of it, they're wondering, do you really have that bad allergy, or are you imitating Breaking Bad? Right? So that's relatively straightforward. But otherwise, trying to regulate commodity materials doesn't make much sense to me either. This is the part where it gets a little more interesting. The true design files, I think, again, there's so many things you can do with design files. Going at that would be silly, though. And if someone tried to, I think it would get dismissed. But the old school issues here, this is wide open. So there are repositories that are similar to YouTube or others where you can go grab files. And they have millions and millions of files. They're growing like crazy, very much like the early Napster or Grokster issues. Now, they're not making the mistakes of Napster and Grokster and saying, hey, come here and grab patented stuff. But the problem is they have their own version already of notice and takedown. But the, the issue here is basically if they get a letter, as far as we can tell, from anyone claiming patent rights, it's so hard to sort out, they just take it down. There's not a system in place because of the strict liability and probably because it's so complicated that if you are a host site, there's no way you want to be in that world. So ISPs also right now could be seen as helping with contributory infringement. So what we suggest then in the paper are two little tweaks that we think would help. One would be we probably need to start looking at changing the notion of strict liability and coming up with what level of possible infringement at the home should the law recognize as not a problem. This already happened with the Audio Home Recording Act in the 80s. I'm sure the copyright industry and the music industry wishes they could stuff that back into a bottle, but the point was it just didn't work. And so they said, fine, certain amount of home use doesn't even count. Um, it, not that it wasn't copying, right? That's a whole other thing. And if Rebecca Tushnet ever watches this, she'll probably beat me up about what I just said. But just work with me on this one. Um, the basic point then is rather than a norm of benign neglect, if we care about a whole bunch of entrepreneurs and as CITB might call it, tinkerers, creating a space so that you can do certain things, and maybe it should be a monetary threshold where the claimed harm, right? If you have a patent and you want to say you were harmed, you've got to hit a certain monetary threshold of actually demonstrated harm before you could sue would be kind of a nice carve out to let people figure out what they want to do. And then if they want to go forth, they got to get their license and turn it commercial. Plus, you probably have to make sure they can't do a class action to get around the threshold. Really don't let them do what, what the RIAA has already done in music. The other piece of the puzzle would be barring a piece, but only a piece of the DMCA, because many people instantly cringe, or at least many law professors do when you say, I like parts of the DMCA, but I do. I think the intermediary liability is pretty good. Let the host sites work within a notice and takedown system. This will take time, because uh, while it's difficult to figure out copyright, and if you think about the millions of dollars and the complexity of what is patent infringement, it would be even harder to figure out. But starting to say, if you're an intermediary letting a lot of files come in and out, we're not going to hold you liable 
you can, as long as you have some system of notice and takedown. This, you know, future work would be very interesting to figure out exactly what it would look like, but we think that following that model is actually a smart move to create space for this technology. So to get to questions and make sure we have enough time, because I know people have to get out of here soon, um, as a simple wrap up, I think the patent system really has relied on disclosure as well as cost to infringe being high. But design, manufacture, distribution of goods have become easier, faster, and less expensive than ever before. The patent law and industries that were relying on patents are going to probably have to adapt. And it won't take many. One or two incumbents will be able to challenge the, the space that 3D printing and similar technologies offer for an uh, incredible amount of rapid growth. You could demand new laws, but the laws should be reasonable. And in our mind, we think that if you go towards a DRM technology, I mean, Ed's work alone shows that not so smart elsewhere, probably doesn't make sense here. Um, you, could ask, you could attack the intermediaries. We've seen that fail. Um, and that the better strategy here is, in fact, a market option. Start to look at where you, as a patent incumbent, can leverage many of your files to go forward. It's a sort of light regulation, acknowledging that it's a general purpose technology. And if we really want to talk about progress of the useful arts and sciences, this space should have some carve-outs, if we have to pass it any legislation at all, to allow the locus and the number of places uh, where you get true innovation, experimentation, and follow-on creation to bloom across households and garages rather than only for high cost high research uh, facilities. If the dawn of the web revealed anything, right, scale at which individuals and businesses engage with copyrighted property really changed how we looked at it. If we want to be able to have the similar explosion in design of things and creation of things, we think that either leave it alone and don't legislate at all and let this area really evolve, but on the flip side, if you start to see lawsuits and start to see takedowns, change the law to make sure that the people who are doing the truly innovative, creative piece of the puzzle are shielded. And I will leave it at that um, and take questions. Yeah. Sure. Happy to. Ed. In the copyright space, one of the things that made these issues difficult was the combination of indirect liability and statutory damages. Yep. Right? So if you were an intermediary who didn't even infringe yourself, but might do something that enables infringement, you could be on the hook for enormous damages. Right. Is that the case for patent and trademark as well? Yes, and that's so why. In the same scenario, Thingiverse could face a judgment of billions and billions of dollars. You got it. So the question was is this similar to what we saw before we had shields and copyright? Is that a, a fair way of looking at it? Yes, and that is why w one of the things that motivated me to write the piece was that that, that is why it's called Patents Meet Napster. Um, while people might forget Napster, it is that same problem, right? Because even if you're not doing the Napster thing, if you're the other intermediaries that are really just there, then you could be open to incredible liability, especially because it's strict. It's even worse than it was in copyright. So that's one reason we wanted to, A, point out uh, the general purpose piece of the puzzle that many technologists know, but try and get law and policy people to pay attention, and then point out that this would be a shield that we may need to put in place to prevent uh, crazy lawsuits. So you could have a, um, copy, a patent owner or trademark owner argue that an intermediary is obliged to look for and filter you got it. anything that infringes, even without there being a complaint. Yes. I think that, that that is one of the areas that's coming up. And my friends who know a little more about patent law than I point out that, yeah, this gets really interesting in terms of contributory liability in patent law. Yes? So, to follow up on that, that shield aspect, um, the uh, House recently passed the bill, H.R. Uh, 3309, which one aspect has a, a stay of um, litigation for users connected with the vendor. Um, is that something that you think would allow people to use the thing of Can you tell me more about what users connected with the vendor is? So one of the problems is in, in patent, I'm patenting this Yep. So one of, the, one of the problems my clients face is they use technology. I service the pharmaceutical industry, mm. and they use a lot of software.
and no legal office gets these letters saying your software, using something as generic as Word, infringes our patent, and we're suing you. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they're worried about this liability, but this aspect of the bill will allow them to hold off on defending it themselves in what we what we Ah, so if I... Okay. So, so to, to restate for the, uh, the folks at home, as it were, if I understand you correctly, you're pointing out that sometimes um, someone might get a cease and desist letter because they're using a software such as Microsoft Word, let's say in your example. But, but Word's a nice example. Um, and the idea was, well, wait, I'm just using that to create a document. If there's a patent thing, that's between you and, and Microsoft, not me. And so that there is some legislation that's trying to get to that. I think that would cover perhaps... Um, the question of the, this is actually a whole extra layer of writing because what, what, what they would come up with is, that's not really going to be an OS question, right? It's, but it might be a, uh, the, the actual CAD design. The question is, what is Microsoft Word at that point? Well, no, but, no, but it's a great example. But, but, but forgive me, it's a great example because it points out some tensions that still need to be fixed in this space in general, right? You know, so the copyright world has the same problem, which is uh, going to come up in the 3D printing space. In other words, well, wait a minute. Which part is the part that might have aided in the infringing? And so if I understand the section that you're describing, I think it would address um, sort of if you gave certainly the operating system and or maybe even the overall design file system, but the specific design, right, if it was specifically to make widget X, then no, it, it would not. It would not, and probably should not be covered because that's a direct infringement. Yeah, I, I don't think that it, uh, the writing of it right. Like, no, that wouldn't take yeah. Using using the technology to make an infringing part, the mm. user would be liable and have no recourse to bring the, yeah. the vendor in. But if uh, if some other aspect along the way were were infringing, yeah. then the user could be protected into the resolution. Yeah. Of that. So that would help a piece of this world, but not all of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure what a joint defense license looks like. That sounds like it could be also a weird group pooling or extortion. I, I, I just I don't get that. But we can talk more about that. Other questions? Uh, Joel, and then yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. Didn't VChip fail? Or do you find V... It's in every, it's in every um, high-def TV now, still infringement. But does it do anything? I mean, this is... So you have a DRM fan in your midst, just so you know. No, just... Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's just that I, I, I've known Joel for a long time, so he's being letting me be, be, be uh, silly with him. But, um, well, but, the, but my, my question is actually genuine, which is, I know it's still out there, but I haven't looked at it because my impression is that no one's done much with it. So I'm not sure when you say that. So would you recommend the hardware have a chip that somehow was trying to detect whether a file is infringing? Yes. Which would be extraordinarily difficult for patent, right? That's part of the problem. If what you're looking so, so the V-chip, I mean, the V-chip notion, I think the reason that nobody really knows the V-chip mm. the burden was on TV users mm. programming. Mm. Right. And every broadcaster is including in metadata the signal right. what the V chip needs to be able to focus. But how much is that? That's a very small pool of information, right? It's very straightforward. There's what, ten or twenty different categories and you can turn them on and off on a V chip? Right. Patent infringement, the doctrine of equivalence, is it really this? Is it? I mean, you're going to either have a perfect ability, which, look, if we get to a world where you could figure out patents that way. Yeah. A basic design file is, is most likely going to be excluded from copyright protection because it's, it's too utilitarian. Yeah. It's a potential 3D device. Okay. It's not going to meet uh, copyright standards. Uh, 
um, it's going to have to need some interface for it to actually work on the printer. Oh. So the question is whether or not you can build into the I see. protocol for that interface yeah. a flag that says this is a permissible de minimis use. Yes. This is something else. OK, so two different things that I was hearing there. Um, I will start with the, the, the second half of the way you put it. So the question was, I, correct me if I'm wrong, could you have a way so that the device would know this is a permissible use of this device and or design file? Um, I would say no. And the reasons are, one, historical, because this was actually where uh, the, some of the early CAD systems had a thing that was nicknamed the dreaded dongle really expensive systems where you actually had a type of DRM. You had to plug in to the computer. And, and Gershenfeld and others from MIT have written about this. You'd put in all this work, and it would decide that what you'd done somehow wasn't an authorized file. And it wouldn't let you go forward with the design. And the problem is, on one level, I don't like that because I think the decision and the history of this was the reason we have all the interesting outcomes of these technologies is that we're not upfront starting to filter. But let's suppose you could as well. The other piece of what you're getting at reminds me a little bit of um, the YouTube Content ID experience. right? So in Content ID, what happens is if we were to upload a, a video to YouTube with some songs in it, it gets run against a, a digital fingerprint of sorts database. If it looks like it's infringing, the uh, uh, possible rights claimant then gets to have a flag, investigate it, and choose to say, yeah, it is. And then what they wish to do, go through the normal notice and take down. Or sometimes they actually choose to put up ads and links to buy the underlying work. Or they do nothing. But the differences there are the work still gets out there. It's not an immediate ban. And I still don't know how you could have a system that you're describing. Um, and again, I defer to the technologists in the room. But to me, the ability to, if you could come up with something that could really be that fine-tuned, you'd also fix the patent system. Because you would actually have a really interesting way to say, at, at scale, that looks like an infringement. That isn't. But I don't think patent lends itself to that, which is one of the things that people are struggling with. What, I mean, what um, you could do is flip the presumption and have something like Creative Commons. Right. And where you can just proactively decide to say to include with this thing a license that says everyone's free to use it for non-commercial purposes or whatever you want to say. Right. And there's nothing technologically that prevents the removal of that. But the pre-filter that, that Joel's talking about, I, 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 do you think that that's viable, Ed? Mm. Right. Mm. Santa Claus says the, the, the patent owner gets to control whoever it controls who can make the device. Mm. So if what you do is you have a flag that says you can't it's it's sort of an on or off, you can make it or not. It doesn't make yeah. its use, it's not going to just the use side, it's yeah. the side. Yeah. But the control of making a, a patentable yeah. object. It's it's, it's a fascinating concept. I mean, to your point, Nathan Mirvold uh, has a patent out there to try and do exactly what you've described. And uh, I will leave it at that because I thought ha we have a hand, and then it's one, two, three, and then four, I guess. Um, I actually think that the response with consumers here would be more like a uh, copyright where, say, you'd rather use Netflix than you download a bootleg copy of a movie versus something like fast fashion where people will very happily buy knockoffs or high fashion. A great point. Um, insofar as it, the assumption is, if you're trying to make it at home, right? Because in fast fashion, you're not making it at home, right? Someone else is selling it. If they could make it at home, would they do that instead? That gets back to why do you buy from iTunes rather than going to the number to BitTorrent? And yet the numbers show that it turns out people still buy music. They still buy and stream videos. Why not? P people who are interested in fashion don't want it to be designed? That's not what you're saying. Well, no. I think that there might be a, a broader range of quality that would be acceptable. Ah. Yeah. Quality. Yeah. No, that could be. But th this will be one of the more interesting market moments. right? If you think about, you can go to New York right, and get extraordinarily good knockoff bags. In fact, during the downturn in 2008, there were articles in the New York Times about very rich people who were having parties about who had the best knockoff that you couldn't tell it from the original. So, and again, I really recommend Barton Beebe's article called The Sumptuary Code uh, is fantastic about this point across IP. 
that it's kind of Neil Stevenson, though we're not totally in a diamond age or replicator age. But the question becomes, if it's as good, why not? And I suppose that that's true for most of these areas, and that, that might defeat my point, but that would also then suggest from a more economic perspective, that means that those industries either we up, come to a world that, like Joel's describing, where we can actually regulate whether or not you get to have your knockoff. Or we admit that our economy is shifting so much towards a whole other way of being that those sort of moments are going to be wide open and that maybe it's not the business you want to be in, which no one wants to hear, but I'm willing to say, well, maybe you, if you're a really smart company, you start to think about, well, where can I actually extract and provide value? Uh, I think it was there and then Brett and then this person. If you tell me what that is, I can probably tell you no. Uh, but no. So for, uh, for printers, for as an anti-counterfeiting uh, mechanism, mm -hmm. there's a pattern of five circles that sort of form a kite. Uh, that's called the Orion constellation. Okay. And if you look at uh, most currency around the world now, incorporates this. Ah, okay. And they get creative about how they do it. So on the U.S. notes, it's the zeros in, in 50 or 20 or whatever. Okay, so it's an anti-counterfeiting system. Mm -hmm. like really cheap home counterfeiting. Mm -hmm. So you could potentially have some other sort of forbidden sequence of bumps or something on 3D objects that people who make nice stuff would put on it, and then the 3D, the 3D scanner wouldn't scan it, and the 3D printer would refuse to print that part of it so you could make an exact copy. It sounds it's intriguing. Like it's not, I mean, what's interesting in the, the money case is that they, the people printing money came up with this in secret. And some researchers figured out that uh, this was the, the symbol that photoshopped it, mm. the core of it. And now you can get a plug-in so that you can print your company documents with that on it so that employees can't scan and print. So it's like had this civilian use that wasn't anticipated. Uh, is it, I mean, do people crack it? Uh, I, yeah, you can remove So let's do the demonstration. Please, 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 <laughs> please. OK, if you have a $20 bill, take it out. And now pass it up to the front. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's why I came. Ed promised me this moment. A new 20. Um, if you look at the back, you'll notice that in the background, in yellow, your small yellow print number 20 over and over, mm -hmm. right? the zeros in the 20, those are circles. It turns out those circles are related to each other in a particular configuration. Um, and if you look at money from all over the world, currency, um, it has yellow circles of that size and that configuration, and, and, um, and printers and scanners will recognize that, and they'll know it's money and refuse to, uh, to copy it because uh, of those yellow circles. Anybody have euros and pounds on yeah, yeah, if euros or pounds, you're probably... I actually might have a five, do, five euro. Well, somewhere. If you have on euros, side, you have I think the 20 euro note has uh, sheet music on the back that incorporates it, which makes it like, totally wrong as sheet music, but that was there. <laughs> So something on this? Yes. Oh, there they are. Yeah. Hey, look at that. Sure enough. So for the conspiracy theorists in the room, it's some secret symbol communicating with aliens, I'm sure. But um, so the question that I would have on that, and really if anyone in the room has got an idea, is that plausible for, because the difference here is you're taking the physical document and copying it, right? But this would be a file question, wouldn't it, in 3D printing? No, the idea is you'd have some forbidden physical structure that the printer would refuse to print, and then the like, people who make a fancy watch or whatever okay. would somehow incorporate this in a way that users would tell you couldn't make So, so this gets back to, to Joanna's question, though, in a way, right? So let's suppose this is the item, and it's got your, your special constellation on it. Yeah. But then I'm going to offer a file that is essentially this without that constellation. Yeah, but then everybody can see that's clearly a knockoff. But who cares? I mean, the pen works great. As long, I don't care about the little... Then clearly you don't care, but if you care about pretending that you were wealthy enough to 
Ah, right. But that's the question, right? That is the question. Absolutely. So you could do that for certain things. So I might really care about that if we got to a world of on-demand pharmaceuticals, right? I'd be much happier if I knew that this was a good thing. I probably would ever never buy it, but who knows what the future will look like. But right for other devices, not so much. Uh, Brett. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, you know, it, enables, you know, it enables a different kind of innovation in the industrial sector that doesn't depend on any business status at all. Right. In which case, sector-specific patent law makes much more sense. That's right. one question. Second question is, is whether in the context of 3D printing, and this is actually the last question as well, um, you actually see an increased uh, demand uh, and reliance on, uh, in a positive way uh, on brands yep. and trademark law. Not necessarily in the trade dress. Now, trade dress should also just Mm -hmm. um, but trademark as a source of quality control, right? And so you can imagine top level domain names where, uh, where you've got uh, brands have their own, you know, got, got Microsoft, got whatever, uh, for each company from which they, uh, uh, you can download the authorized version of a, di of a particular mm -hmm. set of designs, and then you can incorporate either Jules' idea and or this other idea about sort of an authorization you know, yeah. exchange that allows certain things, you know, for those design files does trademark, as it's currently constructed or configured, sort of get us there, or do we need changes in trademark law yeah. to allow that to happen? Yeah. Okay. So the first part, I think, um, you know, you're hitting, as you know, uh, one of the big debates in patent, right? Which is, it might be that if I'm right, the cost question is further accentuated by this shift. That just like in film, right? What uh, film still has a lot of cost. But is copyright really doing the work that people think it is? I'm not positive, right? The folks at CMU, what they did that was really cool was they were able to show that the practice in the film industry of windowing, which is you release it for a, a week or two weeks in one territory and then stagger it around the world, was in fact, their data really suggests that's how you create piracy, right? Because you have a whole world that at one level hates Hollywood because we flood the world with our culture, which they don't think is culture at all. And then they say, but you don't get it for another few weeks. So what do they do? They go to BitTorrent. However, the folks at CMU were able, thank God Hollywood actually was experimenting with this distribution model. And it turned out when the worldwide distribution became almost simultaneous or down to a week, the BitTorrenting dropped to very low numbers. It turns out if you provide the good, right? Copyright wasn't doing a whole bunch of work there. Yeah, lead time, et cetera. But, but to your point, that's an interesting analog too, right? Because most people correctly point out, look, maybe the cost for music and books have dropped quite a bit. But film, right, really big budget film is really a big deal. And the truth is, well, yes, and yet they're finding ways to deal with that market. With things like pharma, et cetera, you know, people who know way more about patents than I do, I think are doing some good work trying to look at can you break it out? Um, and so uh, the quick answer on trademark, because we're almost out of time, is... Um, I think that the irony, uh, given that I do a lot of thinking about trademark, is we might go back to a world where trademark, as it is somewhat explained, works better, where we actually are seeing it function as, yes, this is my seal of approval. Now, the interesting problem there is back to what you guys were saying, which is I could also copy that mark, right? I, that's an old problem in trademark, on any good. So the more the future could look very interesting. In other words, what if you had a better authentication and almost a security system approach to things and files, right? You could be an RFID tag, general matter for something that's already existing, right? As a simple matter to slightly go off base here. Imagine if you cared about, you know, literally, was this made in a sweatshop in Bangladesh? What were the goods? You could have a tag that has true information behind the good. Right? Did, what was, was it fair labor? Was it not? Well, you could maybe also have a world where the files themselves have a whole bunch of extra security. But I think then the, your, your tension becomes, if you move to that, do you start to cut off the creativity of this kind of technology? Or maybe not. Maybe you say, look, unless you really are doing something new and different, we're going to limit how you use this device. But I think that's the fun part about being at CITP, because those are the actual questions that we're always facing with technology. And with that, 
um, I'll hand it back to Ed and say thank you.